Um, thanks everyone for joining us. We've got Anna here from Startups Magazine and Nick from Words and Pixels. Um, they're going to give themselves a question and answer between the two of them and chat about how to get yourself in the media as a startup. Um, Anna and Nick, if you want to give yourself a small introduction and I'll just let you get on with it. Cool. Anna, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, sure. So hi, um, I'm Anna Flockett. I'm the editor of Startups Magazine. So we are a print and online publication for uh, dedicated to championing tech startups. We've been going nearly two years, um, coming up two years. Oh, just over two years. Sorry. And um, yeah, just kind of getting startup stories out there, giving you guys helpful advice, um, guides and stuff to kind of help you throughout your journey and raise your like kind of brand awareness and just create a little nice community really and everyone can come together in a little safe space so i've actually i've worked with with anna quite a lot and, and some of our clients have, have wanted to be featured in, in startups and it always looks amazing so it's a um you know it's a really cool opportunity i think that some of the stuff that that they do is is brilliant and it it really helps a lot just to try and tell the story of companies and that's what we see a lot. So I, um, I've worked in, in PR for about 10 or 11 years. I was previously a, a really large agency, over a hundred people. And I, I ran the technology practice and we became quite well known for launching companies. So we launched happen, the dating app, and we took them from a thousand downloads to about 85 million. Um, we worked with WeWork and Lime. Um, and it's all about like telling a story. And I think that startups are, are brilliant at, telling the the startup story which is maybe sound quite obvious but in a, in a really nice way where you can try and profile the company because everyone starts a company for a reason no one does it to be the same as anyone else and i think they're very good at, at helping with that and i thought the, the you know um anna and i've been chatting a little bit about what would be useful because on from my side we work with right now about 12 different startups companies that have either had absolutely zero investment or they may be um, a little bit further on their on their journey and the point that that we come in is right you've got an amazing product or service or whatever how do you try and get that in front of people that you want to see it and it might be the general public if it's a new app and you want some downloads it might be for b2b audience how do you get to technology service leaders it might be um some of the stuff uh, where you want to raise funding and you want to try and get in front of um, the FT and, and investors. It, it really depends on what you're trying to do. And the background to me being involved in um, this group issue is that we uh, and I launched Amco um, and we did a lot of stuff with, with Tom and Sanj and the team. And the bit that was fascinating there is that this was a new way of doing things. This didn't exist compared to what else was out there. There was WeWork, which is hideously expensive. There was um, shared offices like Regis, again, very difficult to get into and very expensive. And what Anco offered was a very flexible solution at a decent price, which opened up to a new world of freelancers um, and contractors, people who weren't in the same position as maybe a permanent um, employee might be where they have an office or, or whatever. So the reason why Anco got some great coverage then and will continue to do so is all about telling their story. So I thought that was basically how um, Anna and I discussed having this chat because on one side, I'm the one trying to nagging Anna every single day saying, what do you think about my clients? How do you, we can highlight some of the great stuff that they're doing? We take a message and communicate it. But the big part is that this is not advertorial, that Anna at any point can say, no, this doesn't work for us because of these reasons. And, and a PR's role is to take all the great stuff you're doing and being really honest, really helpful and saying, right, that they're not going to publish an advert on you because there's no benefit, but work out the stories, the unique selling points, and then have a conversation with someone such as Anna. And then from an editorial point of view, she'll say, well, is this news? Is this exciting? What would my readers want to hear about that? So that's, that's kind of the way that we've, we focused it um, today. We've got maybe some questions between us. So maybe I'll, I'll start off by, by asking the journalist um, something that, I think most people think they can do, but very few people actually get it right. Anna, what would you say makes a good pitch? <laughs> um, so I feel like there's a lot of ways to answer this question. Um, and a pitch is a pitch at the end of the day. Like you're obviously trying to sell something and like, you know, winners over kind of in a sense. But 
as long as you include enough information to start with, like nine times out of 10, you receive a pitch and it's just like, well, I have this um, idea and this like one little sentence and you're like, you might say yes, because in your in my head, I have one idea and then you send it through and it's completely like another direction. So to start with including enough information about the piece and like you said um, in your intro, Nick, the unique selling point, like why is this piece a good one? Why is it different from any other like PR or story out there? Like what is this, what is going to make this like newsworthy and, you know, gain traction when it's, when it's live? Why would I want to publish this? Mm. Um, and obviously like different journalists might tell you different things, but just as like a little uh, side one, I know, um, when you include like the whole piece in the email, sometimes that can be quite useful because it's, especially if it's like time sensitive and you're like quite busy and the journalist's quite busy and the PR person's also quite busy. If you send a piece over that you think, you know, is a really good piece, has a unique selling point, then I can kind of get it up straight away. There's no like back and forth, like, oh, well, I've got this and how many words do you want? And when should we get it to you? And da, 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 da. like, if it's really like that great, and you think it's worth it then sometimes it is worth kind of just selling the whole piece straight away um but yeah the most important thing without sounding really cliche is what what makes your story unique what makes this pitch unique and what's going to make you stand out from the crowd and like in the inbox of like a million pitches what's going to stand out and me be like oh yeah that one from nick was really good like let's get that one and headline it today so a quick follow up on that then, Anna, scare everybody now, because I think I might have a clue roughly, but I'd love to know the actual truth. How many pitches on average would you say you get a day? Um, probably, depends on the day of the week, probably between 15 and 25. 15 and 25 a day. So yeah. you need to go through like that many and decide whether it's a story or not. So you're looking at, you know, well over 100 every single week. Oh yeah, definitely. And how many actually go up? Um, probably, probably about 60%. Okay. Um, especially because like oh, in one of our later points, um, there's obviously different types of like pictures and stories that <clears throat> we put up and you kind of like sell to us. Like you're saying, there's like the startup stories and the news pieces. So yeah, I'd, well, I'd probably, if you could consider everything, I'd say between 60 and 70%. Okay. Wow. Guys, right, so we have a question from Mark. Um, yeah. He said, what subject line would you go with to grab attention? Um, just something that's a bit different. I can't necessarily give you an exact subject line, but, you know, most of them include, like, the company headline and then mm. uh, XYZ has raised this much money. Why don't you instead say something like, oh, in three weeks they've smashed their target by X amount. So that obviously sounds a lot better than this company has raised this much money. So just try and look at it from a different perspective. Just like it's something that not everyone else is thinking of. You just have to try and think a little bit out of the box. There's nothing wrong with the inclu obviously including the company and how much they've raised. Just, just trying to angle it mm. a bit differently. I think that's, that's a really fair point. But also it, it, it depends on where you're trying to go as well. So we're talking, you know, I would say that Anna is one of the very, very nicest journalists out there. There are some absolutely horrid journalists no uh, offense to your profession Anna but you know um on an average day I would say that if we for our 12 clients if we were to sell in one story from each of the clients so say 12 emails we'll probably hear back from about three That's and, and 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 it really depends on where you're going and what the slot is but it's important that something is so focused on the actual slot so you know for example there's Anna's magazine we spoke about that um, there's BBC online there's the boss slot that's on there there's the telegraph the times it all depends on what sort of coverage you're trying to get and and it why the journalist should be interested because I think that you know Anna's publication covers everything which is fantastic but say you want to speak to a, a finance publication it has to be so focused on that discipline so I would say that the, the subject, couldn't be wrong with Anna, is something that is going to instantly grab the journalist's attention because if you're going to get a load of pitches every single day and you're just going to scroll down through your inbox, what is going to grab someone? Yeah. Um, there's different PR it is. Some PRs, for example, always use capitals because if you have an email with capitals as a subject, 
it physically stands out yeah um in terms of sight line some people hate that because they think they're shouting it's all about it's all about trying to develop that relationship with a journalist know what they like yeah but in that very first instance what what are you trying to offer them that's better than anyone else yeah definitely and so i guess leading on from that you've kind of covered it a little bit but i'm going to ask you two questions in one now what would you say good pr looks like and how do people know when they're ready for pr um uh, the, you know, you're absolutely right the, the two are very very linked so good pr only makes it so to mark you know mark saying you know what subject line would you go with it, you know mark you maybe kind of this conversation um in, in a second when i shut up and you can come in because i know you've got to shoot um but i'd be like what's the story what is success for you so knowing what good pr is has to be linked to when you're ready so if you think that good pr as the client is to generate downloads then you need to have a plan and a strategy which can get you in front of the general public or whomever is going to download the app the point then leads on to no journalist is going to write about something that actually isn't ready unless you're you know a huge huge company and it's an unveiling last year on average a thousand new apps were launched onto the app store every single week so you think that they want to try you know if every single business wants to try and raise their awareness how many emails how many pictures are going out so in order to make sure that you get the journalist attention and what do you have to do to be ready you have to actually have something that people want to get hold of um, and that is really, really key. Uh, that could be, um, well, I'm going to go to Anna, right? We've just raised some investment. Now, Anna, it's not a story for Anna or anybody else when you're fundraising that you are fundraising because so many companies are fundraising and a journalist knows that you're trying to get coverage because you want to raise more money. And they were like, well, that's why, how is that helping us? So it's, you know, when you actually raise some money, that is a story. And because then you can talk around this company's doing great things, they're innovative, these are the backers, et cetera. It's about the narrative. Whereas beforehand, you're not ready for it yet. So um, I think it's important, A, to have the fully fledged story or your actual product available. Because say you're, you've got some new kids toy that's coming out for Christmas and you're like, oh, do you want to feature this new toy? I think it's amazing. Everyone will love it. They want to get their hands on it great, can I trial it? Oh, it's not ready yet. Then you're just wasting their time. I'm not going to come back to you. So I think that is really, and we speak to a lot of clients and we say, to be honest, in a nice way, you're not quite ready yet. And that's okay. Um, I appreciate why everyone wants um, coverage and publicity and awareness, but you're only going to do yourself damage if you try and raise your awareness before you're ready. Yeah. Yeah. And I was going to say, do you tell people when they aren't ready and kind of you know, say, come back to us in X, Y, and Z and give them like little marks to say, you know. 100%. Yeah, because, P I mean, again, I'll ask you a question in a second, but, but I think PR has got quite a bad reputation um, that you're just trying to um, work with, you know, one, one of the challenges is, go back to what is success, is actually agreeing on what is possible and what is fair and what is reasonable. And lots of um, PRs have historically not, you know, not been able or not wanted to commit to a certain amount of coverage or amount of work because they don't have the absolute assurance that people like you are going to be interested in certain stories. And that's a, you know, a question mark over how they're able to, to deliver that. But if, if someone's not ready and you say, oh, you are ready, um, let's go and get you some coverage and they don't, then they fail and you're never going to work with them again. So yeah. when we're a relatively new agency, but our ethos is we're happy to work with clients have got really cool stories that we genuinely think we can help but also we'll be really honest if you're not quite there yet then don't try but also don't try and do it for the wrong reasons as well we've had a few people who've got in touch and say we're um doing x and y around corona we'd like to get some coverage of the fact that people need to use us and and sometimes that can be seen maybe a little bit negatively because they're just trying to use a, a big issue to create publicity for themselves which isn't going to make them look good and don't necessarily think is the is the right approach either definitely definitely um, you need to kind of be more sensitive in times like this <laughs> um so i could i mean i know we've sort of spoken about it a little bit in terms of the different sorts of pitches but on startups there's 
not just interviews. I know you're doing a load of um, podcasts at the moment, but you've got a range of things that you publicize. So what's the sort of content that you guys are looking for across online and the, the magazine? Yeah, definitely. So there is a range, like you say, um, online, um, in the print mag and the digital mag, and we've started podcasts and now we're doing webinars. So there's all sorts of content. So sometimes if one piece of content isn't relevant for one platform that you're pitching, it might be relevant for another one um, or, you know, vice versa. It might just be a better fit somewhere else. Um, we've been getting a lot of like traction on the website at the moment, obviously, because people are probably working from home online a bit more. And um, so that's picked up a bit, which is good. Mm -hmm. But a good piece of content really is kind of like a big change or a big pivot in, in the business, something big that's happened. And like, it could be like you're rebranding or you've got a different product in development or something big newsworthy. That's like a big change that you, that you think is obviously worthy of a news story. Um, which also could link to then like a startup story. So in the issues, we have the longer feature um, startup stories, which go in depth, you know, tell the, the what the company is doing and what products they sell, but also, you know, the founder's journey, how they got there, what challenges they faced. Um, just goes a little bit more personal, which, which I quite like. Um, mm. And then we feature some of them online as well, because you like to keep content fresh. Um, and then obviously... I think they're kind of underrated like news pieces that we've obviously talked about before. Like you said, obviously fundraising isn't a news story, but you know, smashing your targets and doing a massive crowdfunding campaign and blowing out the water is definitely newsworthy. And it's, it's also good for like other startups to see because it's, you know, it's uplifting. If you can do it, I could do it. So it's like egging people each other on. Mm. Um, and then of course, I guess it ties to um, news slightly. We also have content such as like data and trends. So we have like reports and stuff that um, is relevant to the industry. And we have, um, we have obviously startups write pieces like that, but we also have like industry experts or, you know, VCs come in and write about what the funding changes happening recently. Or we've had obviously quite a few people um, in different like expert fields, you know, marketing, funding, uh, product development, write about the whole Corona crisis. So, mm -hmm. you know, looking at the, the landscape and the industry right now from a point of view of, of a different kind of expert. So yeah, it's important to kind of cover all ranges um and all senses and i think each one are like kind of are as important as the other it's just knowing which one you think this story is kind of right for i think that's often one of the hardest things when we speak to a new company and i'll, I'll mention anco seeing as tom's on the call is that you don't always know what is a story before you get there so you're right you know we know that there's a load of brilliant slots, a load of great areas on your website, but for new companies or existing companies, they don't necessarily know what all the options are. They don't know what it looks like. And that's where you need to work with and say, right, who are you trying to get in front of? Part, you know, key for Anco, for example, is getting in front of potential new members. And you think about freelancers and SMEs and startups. So that's why your publication is absolutely perfect. Whereas there's no point Anco being in construction news because you don't necessarily want to appeal to those in construction because they're unlikely to want to use Anco. So it, it's really important to work with any company and say, right, what is the point of you doing this? And then it's our job to guide them and say, right, that's a story, that's a better story, or that's not a story. Because otherwise, when it, it gets to you, you'll be like, well, that's a waste of my time. Definitely. And just kind of going off top, no, it's on topic, but it's not one of your the direct questions, but how important is it for you in PR to kind of know the industry really well so that when certain clients come to you and they, they need to get in front of new members or, you know, marketing experts or whatever sort of field that you know the right people to connect them with? Yeah, I, I think that's massively important because you know, there any company is coming to us because it's something that they can't do themselves um, and, and they know that and, and they're working with, uh, you know, whether if you if you can't build a house, you don't go and try and do it yourself. You work with someone who's done it for a long time and has got experience and knows how to put bricks on top of bricks. I have absolutely zero idea. Hence why I just said bricks on top of bricks. But what is important is when companies say, like, we want to raise our profile. Um, how do you help that we are able to know the broad media landscape? So, you know, right now, for example, 
um, Sky News have completely changed how they are running the, um, the broadcast. A rough rule of thumb is that Sky News, BBC, CNN, CNBC, etc., they will cover the stories that are in the front six pages of the broadsheet newspapers. So you know that if something go is published in the front six pages that is relevant to what you do and you're an expert, you've got some insight on that, then there's a chance that you could go to a Sky or other publications or other outlets rather to be interviewed as a thought leader on that. But you need to know a, that, that Sky do that, um, B, what they use for their sources, um, which I've just gone through, but also who are the producers of the relevant slots. So there's the morning show, the mid-morning show, the Ian King show, etc. And And it's our job to know the journalists, know the producers for each of those, as well as different you know, media outlets, so that if they want to get coverage in startups, they, then they, we know that you're the person to speak to. If they want coverage in the Times, then there's a, you know, uh, 40, 50 journalists there to give them that landscape of what the UK media is like. Because there's national newspapers, everyone knows those. There's TV, everyone knows those. There's also regional newspapers, which are largely owned by two main bodies. So you could get some really great regional coverage, which can be really impactful for certain companies. And then there are trade and business magazines that are um, online or print. And each of those offer something completely different. And a journalist might want something completely different. So I think it's, it's important that you know, we can give that insight. And if someone wants some coverage that is on these stories because of A, B, and C. Yeah. Definitely. Um, Definitely. Um, I, so, I, yeah, go on. Well, I was just going to say is we've sort of spoken about things, you know, content you like and, and something that's that's newsworthy and you get it. Um, but going on, because not every, you said about 60% of all the pitches you receive um, are of relative interest that does mean that 40% aren't. So what are the mistakes that people make? What are the things that people do that you're like, you just, you, you can't feature it, you're not interested in telling that as a story? Um, well, I think if it hasn't got a big enough angle, so like you said, I know we keep using this example, I'm trying to think of another one, but like, for example, if someone's fundraising, sometimes um, going back to your beginning point, maybe there is a story but it's kind of not there yet so like you know this could be a story once you've finished your fundraising round or um like you said they i'm a startup i've got this new idea um i'm gonna take it this direction but you haven't yet so it might not come through so there's no point kind of covering it yeah. for it to then not pull through and it become an official story you don't mm -hmm. want to publish a story that's too soon it's a bit premature um yeah. and then you've got obviously like you need to know your right audience so i'd say nearly 20 percent of the pictures that i receive aren't really tech related and obviously we're a tech startup magazine so i don't know if it's kind of people trying their luck or if it's just because they send it on mass to every journalist they have so it's going to be relevant to some and not to others mm -hmm. um, or they just have forgotten um but yeah sometimes i and i i i I like that you said I was a nice journalist because I do like to think I am. But um, I do try and email people back and say, this is a really interesting story because sometimes they are. They're just not relevant for our platform and our audience. Sure. Um, so I'd say they're the, the main kind of reasons why. And then just as like pet peeves, that's not like you won't get your story published because you haven't done this, but things that would like obviously help is um, when you have like news pieces um, or, you know, little snippets, not like a big feature or an interview that we've got planned. Um, if you don't send an image, sometimes that can be really annoying because I know we've got quite strong branding at um, startups and, oh, I think everyone's frozen. Can you all hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? Um, yeah, we have quite strong brand in the startup, so we use like a portfolio of pictures, and we, we have... can hear you, but you froze them. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, we have like a stock stock images and a portfolio that we use, but when it's like news pieces or um, you know like little products, 
even if we're not going to use it as the main image, sometimes it's nice to have the image to go with the story. Um, so yeah, sometimes oh. that that does get a bit annoying. Um, but it's not essential. Like if you don't send a picture, it doesn't mean you're not going to be kind of published. Um, mm. But yeah, and then obviously on the um, topic of images, some people would send like a headshot, like just a LinkedIn headshot and want that to be used as the main image. And we wouldn't, like we use headshots in like author, author profiles. So we want to put a face to a name and we want people to be able to see who you are and kind of what, who we're talking about. And they're like, oh, can you make this the main image? And we're like, no, not really. Yeah. It's not, it's not, if you saw a headshot of someone, you would be like, oh, that looks really interesting. I'm going to read that story. You need, yeah. the image is sometimes just as important because it can drag you in like the words do. Yeah, it's very, it's very fair. I mean, it, it makes it, it makes a huge, huge, huge impact. Um, there's a, a question from Kelly, which is directed at you, and I don't know whether you can see it on the, on the right hand side which is all about um setting up a press kit and which i think that's perfectly i mean i think i'll sort of jump in to start with and then maybe go on to what you need because a, a press kit is important i would say um it's not as important as some people think um realistically you don't need to have every single possible outlet i'm sorry every single possible asset available immediately because there's only certain things you need the key is that you have um a high res logo because yeah. that is going to be needed at some point and and good quality photos exactly as Anna said photos make a huge difference of whether a story could be a, a nib in a newspaper or it could be a big feature because it can draw people in um, so I think spending a little bit of money on expertise of having a few professional photos done are really really important of the founder or founders um, the leadership team you don't need to spend a lot of money I'm sure there were some um, some photographers on the Anco channel guys, I'm sure, sure there are. Um, I personally work with a guy and he is a couple of hundred pounds for half an hour. Um, and and uh, sorry, for half a day rather. And he'll go through and we'll get a bunch of photos that are suitable for the press. Um, so I think having your logo is important, having a few images, that's pretty much it. Um, you know, some people say, well, do we need to have everything online? Do we need to have press releases online? No, once the story's been published, it's been published. A journalist isn't going to go through your website, look at your press releases and then publish it. Um, of course, having a contact detail of, of yourself or the PR that you're working with is helpful because if you need more follow-up information. Um, but I would say those are the only things that we would recommend our clients have as absolute essentials. Yes, you can have videos, you can have mock-ups of your products, stuff like that is, is always great, of course, but I wouldn't worry too much about it. I don't know whether, Anna, there's anything else that you think people need? No, definitely not. Like like you said, um, having your logo and some images online is definitely really helpful when you've done like an interview or a feature or some of the startups are going to be in the magazine. You ask for pictures and they might send a few of their latest ones and then you go online and you see that they've got some more and you're like, these are great because sometimes you've, you know, you've got more space than you thought or you know, you wanted to add the, one of their images to the contents page or something. So it's nice to kind of have the options there. Um, but yeah, in terms of kind of press kits, like obviously they're handy if you're sending an email in a press release sense and you just click a link and everything's there. But if you're sending the press release, the pitch and the image in the email, then you don't really need them. I guess it's ease for you and the, um, the client and the, the PR person because when you're sending to loads of journalists you just attach the link but yeah for us it, it doesn't really kind of make make a difference in in that sense okay. um so obviously going from kind of what mistakes we we look for and what happens in that sense hmm. turn it to the flip side um I'm gonna ask you again two in one questions what kind of mistakes do you see in PR and what do people not understand about PR um, I, I think it, it really depends on, on how much exposure you've had, but what we have with a lot of clients is saying, well, we want to, um, or people who come to us say, oh, can we work together for a couple of weeks and can we get like, um, you know, national newspapers and then stop working? And, and that will maybe come you know, if that comes from Apple or Google or Man United, maybe it's slightly different because they're well known. But in our world, we're talking around startups and scale up businesses that they 
aren't necessarily known by journalists and it's not a case where they are always going to be of mass interest immediately so you have to try and build up their profile and that's a case of doing a variety of things so again go to to anco for example we did a variety of, of business profile slots with Sanj, exactly as Anna was um, talking about in terms of the, the startup piece. And then we built the profile so that a few people had seen some coverage. It had some, um, some Google traction. And then when we went to um, maybe higher profile publications, we could start to build and get some, some bigger quality pieces like the, the massive feature in, um, in the evening standard. So some people don't actually understand how long it takes and how it's difficult. They don't know that journalists get tens or hundreds of emails a day that it's super competitive they don't know that a thousand apps launch every single week and, and even more startups and that and that it's incredibly competitive but also they don't necessarily know that anything that you write isn't going to be published verbatim because you have to think about what is the benefit to the end reader and yes of course there's massive benefit of saying that X startup is doing amazing, they're the best company in the world and you should work with them. But why would a journalist write that? Why would someone want to read that? They, they wouldn't. So understanding the difference between advertorial and editorial is quite a big thing. Um, you can pay on LinkedIn, you can pay on social media, you can pay in a variety of places to get your exact message out there, and that's what it's for. But editorial is about how do you add to the story um, and how do you provide some, some unique insight into what's going on. And then in terms of not necessarily a mistake, but some things that people don't realize, that every single person who's on this call now will have a background. You guys all did something different this morning. You've got different CVs, different business history, and whatever you've done or haven't done, that is potentially interesting for the press. So um, I can give you a bunch of examples, but if it was a case um, of a, a company that um, has, as sorry, if it's, it's an entrepreneur who's done one thing and then maybe sold his business or her business and then founded something else, the experience that, that they have had helps and leads to potential success now. So from a journalist point of view, if you just go and say, hey, X person has launched a startup, that might not be as interesting as saying the previous founder of this has now done this and it's talking about the lessons they've learned. So it's, it's trying to create that story and really leveraging what they have done. So uh, again, I'm trying to make it relevant to us and talking about Amco, but Sanj, for example, he's had a very distinguished background in, um, in the finance sector. Now he will do certain things uh, with Amco that are different because of his background and that's good. And that, and then he's got a different opinion on what's going on. So I think people don't necessarily understand that, what they do in their day-to-day -day lives is a potential story. Um, one really silly anecdote, but I hope it sort of drums in the point that I was spending a little bit of time in one of our clients' offices and the, um, the finance manager was talking about the fact that she was really struggling with childcare. And she was working at a, an innovative new tech company and everyone thinks, well, they're going to be, uh, they're going to be brilliant. They're going to be able to uh, be flexible and help people and they're the future of work. But actually this company had quite bad support for a new mum. And she was like, well, I'm actually quite disappointed that this is the case. And we said, well, actually, if we can work with the founders of the business, this could be a really positive story talking about how a tech startup had its first mum within the business and the challenges that they were dealing with of running their business, being a fast growth, innovative company, yet they still the individuals still have lives that they have to look after themselves and look after their, their dependents. So that became a really nice story that was positive for the company, but just happened because there was a, a conversation over a cup of coffee. So I think people need, can look inside and say what actually is a story and, and what isn't. Um, now, I know that uh, Adrian's actually asked a, a question sort of to follow on from that, that is sort of any coverage good um, and it's, you know, all publicity is good publicity. I would personally say no, because you could have a piece of coverage that, that could ruin a company. Um, I think the, the point of that is that there, it is so competitive. There are so many companies doing any one particular thing that if you have a little bit of notoriety, you're going to be known and that could have a benefit rather than being completely unknown. I would personally not recommend trying to put out a negative story or have negative coverage 
because you know, we've seen so many issues, certainly in, in tech recently, where companies have grown very quickly and there have been massive people problems. Um, I won't mention any names, but probably all know who we're talking around. I think yeah. I know Anna does from that look. Um, but that, that's, not, that's not great. I mean, Anna, what do you think? I mean, do you think that all publicity is good publicity from a journalism point of view? No, I probably would have to agree with you. And I think it's really scary that, you know, anyone can kind of like disregard, disregard is the wrong word, kind of like dish you and it be taken so seriously and then kind of like ruin you so, so quickly. Oh, it says my internet is unstable. Mm. Can you me? Um, yeah, so I think obviously there is a fine line. Um, it doesn't have to be like, oh, all publicity is like singing and dancing. You you can, it's sometimes good to, you know, be truthful and like, obviously you don't want bad publicity, but at the same time, if there's a story that's um, there, like I've spoken to a few startups within the podcast that have a, an amazing story because they've kind of like pivoted and changed their business. But at the same time, one of the angles is that they've just lost out on a massive funding deal because of the coronavirus coronavirus so it's like it's not good right. publicity in that sense because they're admitting like you know they've massively lost out it's, it's a bit of a rubbish time that they're going through but you know they've turned mm -hmm. it around they've they've pivoted and they've changed and they've adapted and it, they've kind of brought themselves back up and they're like we want to talk about this we want to talk about mm -hmm. the negative with the positives so as long as it's not i agree and not all publicity is good publicity there is bad publicity but it is okay to talk about kind of failures and not negative things, but it doesn't all have to be, you know, sugar coated. I'm doing amazing. Look at me. Yeah. I think that's a brilliant point because no one, you know, life isn't like that. So if you go to a journalist and say, this company um, founded, raised 25 million is now the best company in the world. That's not, we know that's not true. They would have gone through some really difficult times some hardship and all of these things. And those are the bits that people actually want to read because it, it can spur you on. It can excite you to go and do your own thing. So being truthful and being, um, being honest is a, is a massive um, thing. I couldn't agree more. I think that people almost say, well, I have to have the perfect piece of coverage. That doesn't exist. And no one's going to do that unless you pay for it. And it's purely out of the chat because I haven't got too much time. Um, our own Tom Wordy has asked the question, which I think is directed at me because it's about Happen, um, the, the dating app. Taking Happen as an example, is there one piece that triggers a huge amount of coverage and therefore downloads, or does it normally happen more gradually? Um, it, it, it does happen more gradually because you have to build up a little bit of traction to raise awareness to get the pieces so but with happen there was one piece that really worked for them so um it's a, it's a prison app it was founded by a guy who founded daily motion the website he sold that and then he became single and he wanted to was actually trying to um set up an app to help one of his family members find someone and that was sort of the, the backstory behind it then they launched and and we helped them to to raise their profile and what we did was generate a number of pieces of coverage about what they do and so they had a bit more of awareness from absolutely nothing to something but then what was key is that they had grown enough as a business in the uk that they had lots of data and for those of you that, that don't know happen works with hyper geo localization which is one of my favorite words to say which basically means that anyone who's 250 meters around you could see that you're on the app and if you meet each other's criteria would see each other's photos and you could like them and so as a result we were able to do a lot of really innovative stories based on location and so we could say so we did one piece in um january a couple of years ago when in january everyone wants to get fit they want to look after their new year's resolutions maybe one of those is to find a new partner so we did a story um asking which gym is the best to get fit and meet someone fit and it was based on the data of which, which gym had the most number of matches and number of connections and that was a really interesting data story but there was one story that followed that after we'd had enough people using the app for about a year um, and it was well known that we were able to go out and we did a double page feature in the evening standard and it was very very simple it was the 10 um, hottest people 
in London based on how many times that their profile had been liked. And that was almost justification that this was an app that people may or may not want to use because they could see the type of individuals on there. And as a result, they had 130,000 downloads in the next 24 hours. And that was one that I always remember was we had to build up to it. But when we got there, had a, had a huge spike. Um, maybe on to the next question from Kelly. And I'll, I'll maybe ask this one to you, Anna. It's, um, it's from Kelly. Um, because I think this is really interesting what you were talking about in terms of stories as well. What is your view about personal brand and business brand? Is it okay to leverage the personal brand of the founder first and the brand uh, and the, and the uh, sorry, that moved as I was reading it and the brand of your business, or should we just focus on the business? So I think the point is there is how important is the actual individual and can that be the focus or should it just be the company itself? Um, from Startups Magazine point of view, uh, of course, we personal brand and the personal story is very important. I don't know if it should be focused on because at the end of the day, we are getting the startup story out there and the product and what you guys do. So I don't know if it should be the focus. I would never necessarily make the headline about the person, but I think it's it is so important to have that element. And like I was saying, with all the podcasts that I've been doing recently, and obviously all the startup stories we feature in the magazines, one of my first questions is, well, the first question is, you know, what does, what does the startup do? Where did the idea come from? And tell me a bit about you. Tell me about your background. How did you get to this point? You know, what's your background in? What did you do before this? And I think that's really important because then you can kind of gauge more on the business learning about the founder and the, the person behind it or or not even just the founder the team like if there's you know a small team and they're all just as important it's sometimes nice to get to know multiple members and and how that came about mm. and and on that i would say that i was watching someone uh, in the industry's instagram the other day and they've been set a challenge about um branding themselves instead of branding their business all the time branding themselves so I don't know if it's a good idea to, for you guys to go and work on if, if you're looking at branding yourself or the business, but to talk for two minutes and pitch yourself, but not including anything about your business. So pitch yourself and tell us about you and like your interest and your background without mentioning your business and your job at all. And I think a lot of people will find that hard, but it's important to remember you as a person behind the job and behind the title because they go hand in hand and you wouldn't be in that job or founded that startup or you know in this tech business if it wasn't for you and what makes you yeah. if that makes any sense <laughs> yeah, um, uh, yeah. Uh, did you have anything to add on to that one nick no no i you I couldn't agree more. I was just going because I think it's a question for there you. Is, yeah, one from Adrian. Adrian. Yeah, it does content which uh, mentions a firm engagement with, say, charitable causes increase the likelihood of using a story? And does it help if images, stage hands, shapes, old school, I know, are also included? I mean, I think I might be on my own, but I love a good handshake picture. <laughs> <laughs> um, not to be overused, um, but I think, I think yes and no so you don't want to play on that you don't want people to be thinking you're mentioning the charity just to get your story out there but like we were saying at the beginning if it is newsworthy if it is interesting if it's re re relatable you know if it's relevant then then definitely why not it's it's nice to see some feel-good stories out there especially we've seen times like this it's nice to see that people are helping out and lending a hand and doing bits and bobs to help where they can I, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I think you always need to be mindful about trying to use charity to leverage a story and almost be seen as sort of profiteer of charity. However, there are some incredible causes and some things going on right now that rightly should get a, a, a massive variety of, of coverage and help to boost awareness. Um, on a very, very personal one, my, my wife uh, makes costumes for films. She's been furloughed and she wanted to use some of her skills to, to help out. So we live in Wimbledon and she's been making scrubs for local GP practices because 
um, GP practices aren't given scrubs. They typically, typically go see a doctor, they're wearing their own clothes, and then there's a risk and an issue there of um, them transmitting the disease or the virus um, through their clothes to their friends and, and family. Um, so she spent her time to do that, but one of the issues that they've got is that they were doing some great work, that, that 20 different practices wanted some scrubs made and they didn't have enough fabric and they'd already um, spent a lot of their own personal money to do it. So uh, we worked on a release and got some local coverage that led to them raising a couple of thousand pounds, which was enough fabric for a team of about 15 makers to um, make all the scrubs needed for our local area. So I think that one is a good example where charity is the story and without the coverage and without the growing the awareness, then they wouldn't have been able to help out something which I'm sure we all agree is a, a really, really urgent and needed um, support network. So I, I think you just need to leverage it um, delicately and be aware of um, not using it for your own benefit. Yeah. Um, all right, so I don't know how long for 49. Anna, are there any other questions from your side? Or, I mean, I don't know if there's any other from the, from the floor, but anything else that we haven't covered that people would like to? Um, I don't know if, this, if we have covered it slightly, but the only one question that I didn't get to ask because it maybe just didn't flow, um, but I would be interested to know, what is the difference between bringing someone internally and using an agency slash freelancer? Um, it's a really good point. I think people... There isn't a short answer and people do both. Um, I suppose the difference is that if you bring someone internally, then they are going to live and breathe your, um, your company, your brand, and they'll know everything about it. They'll know all the detail and they'll be able to tell that story brilliantly all the time. Um, and that's a huge positive. The difference with a PR agency is they're going to, or a freelancer is they're likely to be working on a number of different projects. So they, won't necessarily or they won't be spending as much time on one particular company so it sounds like the first one is almost the better the bit where i suppose it's different is that the the agency or the freelancer is going to have a variety of different experiences um, and what happens is you know for example with, with you Anna, and some of the conversations that we've had we may have worked on one particular client and then because we've spoken and i know what you guys like and maybe a different client of mine saying actually i think that this might be relevant to you as well so the contacts that you build up, you can you can reuse and provide with you know, really good stories that are completely different. And so some of the best bits of coverage that I would have been involved with might be because I'd worked with a journalist on a different story and built up that relationship. When you're internal, you're only talking about company X and you're only going to have a limited bandwidth to go to certain journalists to whom it's pertinent. And so you might be narrowing down your field of approach and you can only get certain trade pieces of coverage rather than maybe some broader business or national or whatever, because you haven't got that remit. So I think there's, there's positives and minuses for both. Typically, um, you know, when, in our world for, for startups and scale ups, hiring an, an a, a small agency or freelancer is cheaper than bringing someone in house. Usually you bring someone in house when the company grows to a bit of a bigger size, but that point about knowing journalists, knowing the media is, I think, really important because if you're working with a gaming company, you would never really have reason to reach out to the business press. Um, but if you know that someone at the business press is looking for a story about um, what's going on in the world of video games right now, then you can leverage those relationships. So I think that um, as, as positives and minuses, I would always say that it, it's better to use someone with varied experience and then they can focus on what exactly you want i guess it comes back um, to the point that we were saying um, earlier well you were saying earlier um about how you you know the industry so like you know the connection so when people have a story you know which platforms and which kind of people to connect them with so that's the positive about using a, a, an agency with the you know with the experience like you said Oh, have I lost you? Um, an interesting question. Another question, another question from Tom. Favourite PR campaign? Or, 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 is it, is it gonna, from, and I can clearly answer about some of mine, but from your side, what are some of the, the favourite PR stories, ones that you've necessarily written about, or ones that you've seen? 
Um, I think there's been some interesting ones, obviously, recently with, with the whole corona um, side of things, how um, it's interesting to see how companies have completely flipped and changed. So they're doing something brand new and different to adapt. I know I keep saying this, um, but to kind of adapt and change in these times. Um, for one example, um, we interviewed someone on the podcast who um, printed 3D um, kind of accessories to help people that had lost limbs and stuff, help them with day to day life. And in this coronavirus time, um, he just stopped doing that well, put it on pause and use his 3D printers to just print loads of um, PPE masks and equipment and was just distributing it to hospitals for free. Um, and so it's really like a feel good story. Um, that obviously, like we said, it was like the charitable kind of cause and that. Um, and and he, we reached out to him. So I, I actually, I guess it's probably not really a PR campaign, but we reached out to him and then kind of like pushed it out. And yeah, he was just so humble and so nice and just kind of stories uh, like that. Yeah, the feel good stories, they just get to me. <laughs> yeah, I, get that. I think I, I I won't mention one that I've worked on because I think that, because it was a surprise, it's one that I always remember, I think has had incredible impact and it was about um, two years ago, but they've subsequently done it. Um, and it was all around um, the need for blood donations. And so it was done by, um, uh, I can't think of the blood charity, I can't remember what it's called. And it's called Missing Type. And if everyone has a, has a look at it, and it was a variety of, of large businesses all um, come together and they did versions of their logo or their name without the key letters of the major blood groups highlighting um, that people were missing um, out of blood that they really needed. And it was this incredible call to action. It was so, so simple. I remember like Man United, they took Manchester United and got rid of A and O and just to highlight the fact that these were blood groups that were desperately needed to help people in hospitals to look after them. And it's something where it was so, so simple. The execution was so, so easy, yet it had incredible impact because all these people banded together for a great cause. Um, and again, I just thought that was a lovely example of what, what can be done just with a really simple, clever idea. Definitely. I mean, the one going around at the moment um with the nhs um it's just so simple it's so except effective there's just a line that says we stay at home so when we go back out no one is missing or something and it's just literally mm -hmm. one sentence and i've seen some of them just on like white words on a black screen and i'm like it's so powerful um it yeah. really just kind of makes you think and it's yeah like sometimes less is more and the more simple the more effective it can be yeah, I agree. I agree. Well, I think we've done it. Any other questions from anyone else? We've pretty much perfectly timed otherwise. Thanks, guys. Is that it? Yeah. That's great. Um, no, really helpful. And I think um, what I'd like to do is because we set up a private um, chat group. So I'd really like to keep this conversation going. And if anyone is working on anything at the moment, um, if they had like kind of any advice, would you guys be okay just to maybe help them out a bit? Um, and maybe even, you know, if we are struggling with this side of things in our business, is there a way we can set a little task up so that like we can meet back maybe in, in like two weeks time and check in with each other and make ourselves accountable to something we'd like to do for our businesses? Yeah, That's nice. yeah I mean, I know this, I've done this before where um, one of the things we haven't really got onto is the ability for, for data and I think for tech companies in general, there's a mass opportunity to use data that they have at their disposal to tell stories. And I think it's one of the things that you mentioned earlier, Anna, that the data and trends and highlighting. So maybe one thing is to look at what's been happening within the businesses here over the last um, couple of months and any sort of spikes, any uh, data which sends that, says that things have gone up, down, left, right, whatever, and what trends you can see from that. And potentially there could be some, some stories in there. Definitely. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, thank you very much for everyone's lunch hour and Anna, lovely chatting with you. And lovely chatting with you. Thanks everyone for joining Thanks. us. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.